Uh, God be with you, and uh, today we talk about balance of God's grace and law applied to sermons. And uh, this teaching, a balance of God's grace and law, uh, is not easy to learn. Uh, I also call it God's nature preaching method. Uh, that's another name I give it. God's nature preaching method. That means we talk about God's grace and His uh, uh his nature and His grace. and um, Now, it's not easy to learn. The reason is because most people grew up, uh, most people grew up in uh, under the law. That most of the time, they just, they just told, you know, you have to obey, you have to do this, do that. Uh, it's always obedience. And then if you don't obey, then there will be bad consequences. Then uh, we don't love you, we don't care about you, and you, you are nothing. And so, uh, when people grow up under the law, that uh, then even when they believe in Jesus, they, uh, you know, we're, when we're saved, we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, it's a gift. But as soon as people, you know, start to grow in Jesus, they will tell, you know, the, the, the leaders will tell them, you have to obey, you have to love God, you have to... Uh, Repent. You have to turn away from sin and obey God. If not, there will be bad consequences. So a lot of times, people just, you know, uh, they, you know, they didn't understand that the Bible is full of grace. The Bible is full of promises, and they just, uh, uh, a lot of times, just uh, apply the law to people to motivate people. Now, the law is not wrong. The law is what God uh, has given us. To obey the law is what the Bible tells us. The point is, the Bible motivates us with God's grace, mainly, uh, mainly by saying that you know God has these promises. God works in our life. God uh, is is helping us, blessing us. So, so uh, the Bible is full of promises. The Bible is full of promises. So that's how we. Um, that's how we are motivated to obey the law. But many people just use the law to motivate people. Just say, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. So, um, so a lot of times people just use the law to motivate. And what happens is then uh, it becomes pressure. And also pe people would, you know, um, would have guilt feeling, they will feel they are not doing well enough. So it's very important to balance God's grace and law in our teaching. Now here, uh, comparison of God's law and God's grace. God's law tells us what to do. Okay, so it tells us, you know, to love God, to love people, to re repent of our sins, to, uh, to forgive people, uh, to uh, enter God's plan, you know, all these are God's law. Tell us what to do, whatever we do, including loving people. I, some people think, well, loving is so gentle, so it should belong to grace. Now, God's love for us is grace. Now, what, whatever, you know, when there's a grace statement, it's always God doing something to us. God blesses us, God forgives us, God loves us, God gives us eternal life. God helps us, God gives us the Holy Spirit, God changes our life. All this is grace. It's God doing something to bless us. And the law is always, you know, we, you know, uh, we have to love God, love people. Uh, we should, you know, obey God, uh, repent of our sins, and this is God's law. And God's law also tells us God's judgment and punishment. Now for this statement, it's also God and people, but it's God warning the people. God uh, judge the people. God discipline the people. So it's also God and us. And then the action is judgment or warning. But grace statement is always God helping us. God blessing us. God doing something to bless us. Um, so that's God's grace. Okay, now, so God's law includes uh, God's judgment and punishment. And then 
Grant's grace tells us God's forgiveness and help. Uh, all the helps that God gives us. You know, He changes our life. He gives us a new nature. He motivates us. He gives us joy. He gives us strength. All of these uh, are God's grace. And uh, God's law motivates us by punishment and fear. And God's grace motivates us by grace and love. So uh, God's law would say, you know, if you don't obey, then there will be punishment. You know, uh, not everyone who enters the kingdom of God except those who, you know, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So if you don't obey, then there will be punishment. Now, this is a law statement. Now, it's, it's, it's right. It's correct. It's a law statement. It's a correct. But the Bible also has great statement that tell us that it's God changes our lives, that we have a new nature. When we abide in Him, He abides in us, and then He will stay in us, and then we'll bear much fruit. Now the grace there is that He causes us to, to grow, to have fruit. Now remember, we abide in Him, that is law. And then He abides in us is grace. He does something to us, and then we'll bear much fruit. Now that is both a law and uh, uh, a grace statement. In a, uh, it's a law statement in the sense that we then bear fruit. It's a grace statement that God causes us to bear fruit. So whatever God does, so a grace statement always starts with God and then with people, God helps us, God causes us to bear fruit. So He abides in us, that's grace, and causes us to bear fruit. So some people will just say, okay, you have to pray and then so you can bear fruit. That is a law statement. You have to, you know, have a close relationship with God and then you'll bear much fruit. So it's all what you do. But the Bible doesn't just say that. The Bible does tell us God's grace. You know, when Jesus said, you know, abide me, I'll abide in you. That is a promise that God has given us many promises to motivate us to obey Him. So He abides in us, and then when He abides in us, we'll bear much fruit. So He causes us to bear much fruit. So that is a great statement that causes, God causes us to, to bear much fruit. So um, for a lot of action, you know, there is a human part that what we do, and there is a God part, what He does. The main thing is we understand God's grace, what He is doing, and then that will motivate us to obey Him. Okay, and God's law should not be the main motivation, and God's grace should be the main motivation. So we should, you know, we should not be just, you know, uh, saying, okay, I have to do this, I have to do that. Now, if a person is just saying, I have to do this, I have to do that, it's always, it's, you know, it's always the law. They always, you know, you have to do this, you have to obey, then it's, it becomes a responsibility only. It's always responsibility. It's always uh, uh, that you have to do this, you have to do that. Then it's, then it becomes just the law, just, you know, just you have to do this, you have to do that. It's just responsibilities all the time. So I hope that we don't just live under the law. We don't just you know, saying, you know, motivation by the law, but we are motivated by love, by His grace, by what it does for us. Um, now, let me use another illustration first. Uh, another illustration is like this, that um, when two persons fall in love, when they fall in love, then, you know, they treat each other nicely. You know, if you have the experience of falling in love, you, you know that at that time you really want to talk to the other person, you want to see the other person, you want to uh, give gifts to the other person, you want to do nice things to the other person. And then, at that time, it will be very natural for one person to do nice things to the other person. Now, that is living under grace. But that's human grace. But still it explains, you know, what's the difference between uh, under God's grace and God's law. It's the same principle. When two persons are in love, they are motivated to love each other. They're motivated to be 
caring to each other. They would be kind to each other. So that becomes natural. That becomes easy for, for them. Okay. Now, but after marriage, sometimes, you know, it's unfortunate that many people, they don't, you know, they, they don't pay, uh, they, they lose the love for one another. They lose the interest for one another. And then they demand the other person to do, to, you know, to do all the responsibilities at home. You have to wash the dishes, you have to clean the house, and you don't clean enough, you're not doing well. That way, then it's always saying, I have to do this and do that. If not, my spouse will be unhappy with me. Now that is motivation by the law. I hope you understand this. Motivation by the law is... It's always, you know, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. If not, there will be consequences. Then I won't like you. Then I will not, will not be happy with you. Then I'll yell at you. So that is motivation by the law. The Bible doesn't motivate us mainly with the law. Mainly is motivation by God's grace. That when we do this, even when we give a cup of cold water to a little one, we'll by no means lose our reward. That means... Even when we do a little thing to obey God, God is very happy and He will give us um, this motivation. He will, he will uh, uh, bless us. He will reward us. So that is motivation by, by grace. So as applied to like marriage, now some, you know, like for me and my wife, we really love each other. And I, I understand the principle. If I treasure my marriage, then God is happy with me. So I treasure my marriage. And also, when I treasure my marriage, then my wife and I will both enjoy the marriage, and it will be beneficial to us. Then it will not be like heavy responsibilities. Uh, even though we do a lot of things for each other, but we feel happy. That is motivation by grace. But many people don't understand this. They, they yell at the spouse and they demand the spouse to do well. It's all the motivation by the law. And then what happens is, then marriage becomes hard work. It's always responsibilities. And the same it applies to our relationship with God. If it is always just doing things, just doing responsibilities, then uh, what happens is when they cannot do well, they, say, they feel guilty and they say, uh, I'm afraid God is not happy with me. Uh, God is seeing me, you know, seeing all my problems and, and God is not pleased with me. And so people are afraid. Uh, they, they are under pressure. They also will criticize themselves and criticize others. They will say, well, the other people are not loving God. They're not serving God. They're not obeying God. So they will say all these things. But when we, are, uh, we understand God's motivation, understand His grace, we'll say, when I do a little thing for God, He was very happy. And when I do more things, He is happier. And so I'm happy to do more things for God. I'm happy to dedicate my life to God. You know, when we, we uh, so the motivation saying, you know, I have, you know, God has this wonderful plan. If I uh, offer my body as a living sacrifice and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of the mind, then we'll discern the good and uh, perfect and pleasing will of God. Now, so the motivation there is God's grace that He has a wonderful plan, a perfect plan. When I obey Him, now that's the law, when I obey Him, then I'll enter this perfect plan and this perfect plan is perfect for me. It's pleasing to God and pleasing to people, pleasing to me. I'll be happy with that, with that perfect plan. So that is motivation by, by God's grace. But people can use this Bible verse, uh, just with you know, with laws, uh, with uh, motivation by the law. You know, that this is how they will say if it is motivation by the law. Then they will say, now you have to offer your body as a living sacrifice. If not, you cannot enter God's plan, and you suffer. And uh, and you know you you, uh, you cannot uh, follow the world. You have to your will has to be transformed. Uh, and if not, you can enter God's plan and then, you know, that bad things will happen to you and you will not be blessed by God. Your life cannot go to a high level. And, uh, and so just motivation by the negative. You have to do this. You have to do that. And if you don't do it, 
there will be bad consequences. That will be motivation by the law. So the same Bible verse, you can use, you can see the grace there and motivate people with grace. But people, you know, some people, they grow up under the law. The whole life is living under the law. Then motivation is always by the law. It's always have to, have to. They have to do these things. And then they, uh, what happened is, um, they, you know, that motivation would become weak, actually. That's why many people, they continue to sin because they say, well, I cannot fulfill God's requirement. I, it's too hard. Uh, so I, I just give up. I, I just, you know, uh, uh, I just ask God to forgive me, and, but I cannot do my best. I cannot offer my whole life to God. But when people see, well, whenever we follow God, God is very happy with me, and I can enter His perfect plan, and His perfect plan is very, very good, then we'll be happy in this perfect plan. Then we'll enjoy this perfect plan, and we'll enjoy the process. So I hope you all understand this, the difference uh, of um, motivation by God's grace or God's law. Okay. Now here I use an illustration. You know, a mother is pregnant for 10 months before giving birth. And the process of giving birth is painful. And then the parents have to provide, have to teach the child, help the child, take care of the child. And, uh, but the, the child might not feel his parents' love. You know, as a mother, the mother understands how it is for 10 months. She'll carry the baby in her womb and how she has to be careful with the womb, how she cannot, you know, uh, she has to um, be careful with her body and she cannot jump, she cannot uh, do vigorous exercise, so she has to take care of her body. And she's aware of the baby kicking inside her. So, and then she will have this love for the baby. And after the baby is born, the, the parents are very happy, especially the mother, because the mother carries the baby for a long time. And the baby, the mother is very, very happy. And, and then when, uh, you know, when she has the baby, she's very happy. And you know, I saw some videos online on YouTube of, ba of mothers giving birth to babies and to see how she was crying out uh, loudly uh, in the uh, birthing process that she was in great pain. But as soon as the, uh, the, the baby is born, she is very happy. She is smiling. She forgets about her pain. So she has gone through a lot and then she has to take care of the baby all the way, you know, all the way uh, to their adulthood, that they still take care of the, uh, they would still uh, care about the, the child. Now God, now, but the child may not appreciate the mother. The, the child may not, you know, see the, all the good things the mother and the father has done for him. And uh, the, so the child may not appreciate that much. Now it's the same thing for God. God has done a lot. You know, sometimes we just experience something. For instance, we pray and we experience peace or joy, and we just say, well, God gives me peace and joy. We do not understand that. In order for us to experience His peace and joy, God Himself is full of love and joy. He is full of love and peace. He is very peaceful. And wherever He is, he gives our peace and love. So He comes into our heart and cleanses us from our sins, forgives our sins, and come close to us. And then when He comes close to us, He gives us peace and joy and take away our burdens, and then we feel peaceful. So for us, we just feel the feeling. And some people even don't realize that it's from God. They just say, well, when I praise God, I feel happy. They didn't realize that it's God's working in their life. So they don't appreciate. You know, when we understand this, we say, well, God, every time when I pray, you come to me and give me peace and love and joy. That's wonderful. That let me enjoy heaven. That I can see heaven is enjoyable. 
that I can enjoy heaven. It's wonderful that I can enjoy heaven. And I understand that when I go to heaven one day, it will be very, very enjoyable. So when we understand this, we will say, wow, God, you're so wonderful. When we understand how many things God has done for us. For instance, you know, God changes our nature. God gave us a new nature when we are born again. And then He continues to motivate us to grow in Him, to love Him. He continues to motivate us to, to repent of our sins and to uh, turn away from our sins and to obey Him and serve Him. He continues to motivate us even when we sin. Even when we sin. God still continues to move us to repentance. He touches us with His love. So that is what God is continually doing every day. Every day. That, you know, in Psalm 139, verses 16 to 18, it says that, you know, all the days of my life because before one of them came to be, it's already written in your book. O oh Lord, how precious are your thoughts to me and how numerous they are. That God has this, you know, wonderful plan for each day of our life. And God has wonderful plans, wonderful thoughts toward us. He wants to bless us. If we understand how many times God has blessed us, how He has changed our life, how He accepts us and forgives us, then we'll be very appreciative of His love. We'll say, God, you're so wonderful. God, you're so good to me and you have done so many things to me. Then God is very happy when we, you know, when we delight in the Lord. The Bible says, you delight in the Lord and then He'll give us the things we desire and also He'll cause us to go to a high place. That He'll cause us to, our life to go higher and higher. So God has done many, many things. When we experience one thing, actually God has done many, many things to achieve that. Our salvation. God has prepared for the salvation, you know, uh, actually before the creation of the world. And what He announced it when, uh, to Adam and Eve that you know that uh, that Christ you know one day the, ch uh, the child uh, from the woman uh, will crush the serpent so uh, that there is a plan already of salvation and then all these years in the Old Testament he prepared for the coming of Christ and finally Christ came and then he you know God has a wonderful plan that uh, the, Jesus said, you know, what God tell me, the Father tell me to do, I'll do. And what I see the Father's doing, and I will do. So, uh, God is demonstrating to Jesus. Now, Jesus is God, but Je Jesus is submissive to the Father. That the Father shows him what to do and what to say, and he follows that. So, God has a plan already, what to do, what to say on earth. And to prepare for... Uh, Jesus dying on the cross and teaching us all these teachings. So, so we thank God for that. We be, if we count all of God's blessings, we'll say, God has done many, many things in order to give us salvation. God has done many, many things to change our nature, to give us joy and peace, to give us strength. God has done all these wonderful things in order for us to experience the new birth experience. But many people just see the new birth experience and they did not see what God has done. It's like for the child. He just sees that, well, uh, my, my mother gave birth to me and gave me food and gave me uh, uh, the place to live and uh, helped me to, you know, give me uh, opportunity to have education. So he just sees that. But he did not see everything that parents have done for them. And it's the same. Many Christians don't see all the wonderful things God has done for us. That He is the, you know, the, uh, the beginner and the finisher of our faith. That He begins our faith and He finishes. He maintains us, helps us to follow God all the days of our life. He works in our life all the years so that we can obey Him. So when we understand this, we will say, God, we have missed so many of your grace. So many things you have done for me and I did not pay attention to it. So I hope we we'll all understand what God has done for us. What wonderful things He has done for us. 
so that we'll appreciate him more and we'll we'll enjoy him more and we'll say I'll follow you I will love you okay and the Bible tells us also that we we'll live out partake of his divine nature and also uh, the Bible tells us to declare to proclaim uh, the wonderful deeds and gracious acts of God so the Bible does tell us to partake of his wonderful nature and also to declare his goodness his gracious acts and also that Christ be more magnified in our body so the Bible does tell us to do that is Christianity is not just telling people to obey God now that of course obeying God is part of what we should do but our teaching is not just telling people to obey God our teaching should be first to magnify God to tell people how wonderful God is to tell people God's nature God's grace and to let people see how wonderful God is that is our first thing and then when we tell people that and also we live out God's nature in our life we live out the peace and joy and love and compassion of God then people see God living in us and then they are attracted uh, by God they are attracted by God's Spirit also they are attracted by our life that shows God nature God's nature so when we understand this we need to understand that we should live showing God's nature we should live showing God's grace and when we are preachers it's very important that we live in his uh, his nature that we're full of his nature we you know we live out his nature uh, we appreciate his nature we tell people about his nature so it's very important that we our whole life that we are appreciating God okay now um, 1st Peter 1 2nd Peter 1 4 by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust so we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust through sins through our sinful nature that we may be partakers of divine nature of the divine nature that we can partake we can experience his divine nature so first we should understand God's nature from the Bible and appreciate his wonderful nature he is full of love he is holy he is caring he has strong compassion he is forgiving he has a he is a wonderful planner uh, he he can he is omnipotent he is almighty he is omniscient he knows everything he can plan things ahead of time his plan is the most wonderful things so all this his his nature we understand his nature and then we appreciate his wonderful nature God is so perfect there's no one like him God is so wonderful there is no one like him so we should all understand and appreciate his wonderful nature and then we should live out God's nature like his love joy peace patience and compassion in our lives so that our life should be you know that we should think about God's nature and then we live out his joy and peace because he takes care of everything everything therefore I can I can have joy because everything I do for him even a cup of cold water to give to a little one will by no means lose his reward therefore I'm happy I'm joyful because everything I do for God he's very very happy so that is grace motivate us to have joy when we understand that God is in control of everything and God is doing wonderful things then we'll have joy and we'll have freedom and then we should teach God's nature so that people will appreciate and live out, uh, live out his uh, uh, live out his nature so we should teach God's nature and tell people God is wonderful God is loving God is kind God is good God is holy and many people when they hear God's holiness they think that is something very serious and very strict now he's very strict in a way but because we have Christ's righteousness therefore in God's sight we become like Christ 
That is in uh, Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10. Isaiah 61, 61 10. That you know we can rejoice in Him because He has clothed me with His salvation and His righteousness. And then we are like a, 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 a bridegroom and a bride adorned beautifully. So that we have the righteousness robe, the righteous robe of Christ. We have His salvation covering us. Then we become beautiful like a bridegroom and a bride. And so we say, wow, this is wonderful. God is, His holiness is wonderful. His righteousness is wonderful. And heaven is beautiful because in heaven there is no more, no more sin, no more yelling, no more anger, frustration. There's no more curse. So heaven doesn't have any more sin and heaven is beautiful. Heaven is wonderful. So therefore when we understand how, how wonderful heaven is and how wonderful holiness is, then we, we appreciate God's holiness. And then we live out His holiness and we teach that and we enjoy His holiness. We enjoy, you know, repenting of our sins and obeying God. We enjoy that. You know, in the past when I did not understand this teaching, you know, from time to time I would sin now. I'm not perfect now. But whenever I have sinful thoughts now, I will take care of it right away. That whenever I have any frustration, anger, I immediately I take care of that. And I will say, uh, sin will destroy me and I don't want to sin. And when I obey God, God is very happy. So I ch choose to put down the anger and frustration or unhappy feelings or despise of people. I put down all those thoughts. Or lust, any kind of lust, I will put it down right away. Because I know that it's destructive. And so I stop my sinful thoughts as quickly as possible in a second. In my mind, and whenever any sinful thought appears to in my mind, I immediately I'll take care of that. But there are many people who live, you know, they you know, even in my past, in my past because before I was filled with the Holy Spirit. From time to time I just let sinful thoughts stay in my mind. I allowed negative thoughts stay in my mind. I allowed negative feelings stay in my mind. And I allowed lust to stay in my mind. But now I understand how serious that is, how destructive it is. So I take care of that. And I know that when I obey God like that, God is very, very happy. So I can be happy all the time because God is happy when I take care of my sins. Now I'm not perfect, but I try to turn away from sins as quickly as possible. Then I'm living in, you know, in a, a righteous way and I know God is happy and I'm very, very happy. So that is living in His nature and enjoying living in His nature. Now God's nature is very wonderful. It includes love, His holiness, His justice, His just, His has compassion. He has care for people. He can understand all people. He understands us and He accepts us. And He wants to bless us. And He has ability to transform people. And He's prosperous. He has everything. He owns all the resources and blessings. He has everything. He's almighty. He's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Wherever we go, wherever we are in trouble, He's there too. He's all-knowing. So we see how wonderful God is and then we'll say, Wow, God, you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful.